right, so this morning, once again, we'll be in Revelation chapter 3. We'll start in verse 14, and we'll work our way to verse um, 22. And this morning, we're going to look at the letter to the church of Laodicea. And uh, that is our seventh and final letter that we've been going through here, uh, through the book of Revelation. And the title of the message this morning is Lukewarm uh, Christianity. Lukewarm Christianity. So before I get into the study, let me go ahead and pray once more, and then we can uh, look at this together this morning. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this privilege, Lord, this opportunity to come here together, to worship, to praise, Lord, to study your word, to grow together as brothers and sisters in the Lord this morning. We pray that you fill us once again, fill this place with your Holy Spirit, Lord. We pray that our minds and our hearts would be prepared to receive your word, that it would solidify within us, Lord. It would change us. It would become a part of us, Lord. Just please help us to leave different from how we came in here um, this morning. We pray this morning once again, whatever we brought in here with us, that we would lay those things at the foot of your cross and leave them there, Lord God, and focus on you. We love you so much. We thank you for getting us through another week. And uh, we look forward, Lord, to the things that you are going to do and continue to do in our lives and through our lives, Lord. We love you and we praise you. We pray these things. We ask these things in Jesus' name uh, this morning. Amen. Well, we all know that uh, children are well known to be blunt and also revealers of many things, including the truth. And um, a few weeks ago, I read a story about a young lady, a little girl. Her name was Mackenzie, and um, she was having Thanksgiving with her family. And she began to play around and fiddle around with her grandfather's wedding band. And the grandfather looked at the wedding band, and he told her, you know, that never comes off. And he says, you know why? Because I love Nana very, very much. So Mackenzie looks at her grandfather. She stares at him, and she says, well, you know, Nana takes hers off. And clearly, she was ratting out her grandmother. Her grandmother apparently took off her wedding band. Um, didn't necessarily mean she didn't love her husband. But as we can see and as we've seen in our own lives, children are well known to rat out people and to tell the truth. Sometimes they lie very well as well. So it just really depends on the situation. But I think similarly, as we grow in the Lord as believers, we too need to be just like children in a sense that we too need to be exposing everything that is not from the nature or true to the nature of God, especially when it comes um, to the church. And I remember a long time ago, somebody asked me, why do some people in the church create so many problems? And the truth of the matter is, yes, there are some people that come to church to create problems, but often people are simply exposing the problems. And the reason why these problems are coming to the surface is because they've been there for so long. And because of complacency and because of comfort, those problems have become the norm. And now that they're coming to the surface, it becomes this uncomfortable um, confrontation. And unfortunately, this morning, what we'll see with the church of Laodicea is that they were blind to these great problems that resided within um, their church. And they were unwilling to face the truth due to their um, complacency. And this was a church, as we'll see throughout um, the word this morning, that really enjoyed material prosperity. They believed that that coupled with a facet of religion or faith, it kind of gave them a false sense of security and independence, yet they were in a very terrible place um, spiritually. You see, spiritually they were lukewarm and they had great needs. But because of their lukewarmness, they were unable to recognize those particular needs. And as believers, we know that the beginning of blessings begins with honesty. And when we are finally able to admit what we are and who we are, and we confess our sins to the Lord and allow him to come back into our lives and to use us, that's when the Lord can bless us um, the greatest, right? And this is something that we certainly will learn this morning through this letter to the church of um, Laodicea. And what we'll see too this morning is, is that this is one of the harshest letters that we've read so far. It's actually the last letter. Um, but at the end, it has a very promising uh, ending, and we'll talk more about that when we get to the end. But this letter, we need to understand, is very important now as it was then because we are still living in this church age. So just a little bit of a background, and I'm going to put a map up really quick here. Um, to show you this, uh, here we have a map of these seven 
churches of Asia Minor. So on the bottom right corner, we have kind of like a, a larger view. The view that's behind it's kind of an, um, like an, uh, an expanded view. So this is like modern day Turkey. So we have Greece in the, in the lower map on the left side, which is to your west. And then we have modern day Turkey to the right, which is um, the east. And then this little section in red is um, a magnified section of the map, which is what we see in the back here. And the churches are numbered one through seven. We have Ephesus obviously beginning, and then it works, out to, it, it works its way all the way to Laodicea as you go clockwise, okay? And remember, so far we've talked about, for example, the church of Ephesus, which is that first church there. That was the church that left their first love. We've talked about um, the church of Smyrna, which was a suffering church, the church of Pergamum or Pergamos, which was the compromising church, the church of Thyatira, which is number four up there. Um, that was the corrupt church, the church of Sardis, which was the feeble church, number five, and then the church of Philadelphia, which is number six there. That was the, um, the faithful church that we talked about the last time. And then today we're going to look at church number seven, which is the church of Laodicea there on that map. And this was the lukewarm church, or maybe you can even call them the foolish church. Now, the city of Laodicea was about 45 miles southeast of Philadelphia. So once again, Philadelphia is number six on that map, and Laodicea is number seven. So about 45 miles southeast of there and about 90 miles east of the city of Ephesus. It was located near a place called Hierapolis. So Hierapolis was between Philadelphia and Laodicea. That region was well known for their hot springs, okay, and, and I'll tell you why that's important in just a little bit. There was another place that they were close to called Colossae, which was just south, indicated by that uh, blue triangle there. So that was Hierapolis there, and then there is Colossae. Okay, and Colossae was actually famous for their uh, uh, cold water, pure cold water. And when you think about Laodicea, this was a church that was well known for its wealth and its manufacturing of uh, textiles, specifically glossy black wool, okay? Um, it was the center for worship of the healing god Asclepius. And in fact, there was a famous temple there um, in the city of Laodicea, specifically for the worship of Asclepius. And just like Philadelphia, which is that city north of there, number six, um, this was a region that was located in a very active geologic site. So um, there was a lot of faults. There was a lot of, of what they call normal faulting and slip, uh, strike slip faulting. So th there was a lot of earthquakes in that region. If you remember Philadelphia, the city itself had been destroyed by an earthquake early on. But this city also suffered from earthquakes. Now, unfortunately for the city of Laodicea, they had to pump in their own water. Um, they didn't have water within the city, so they had to pump it in from outside. And because of this, it made the city susceptible to drought, but also to attacks from, from enemies. If they had any oppositions, they could attack their, their water supply. So what they used was an aqueduct system. Now, that was a system that was quite um, novel in that particular time. It was like this amazing feat of engineering. And basically, it was a bunch of pipes and tunnels that uh, would, um, you know, by gravitational uh, force, the water would flow downstream and make its way into the city of Laodicea. And we'll talk a little bit about um, why that's interesting and why I'm mentioning that as we get into the study this morning. Now, the church itself was probably planted by an individual named Epaphras. And if you read about this individual, you can look into Colossians chapter 1, verse 7, um, he was also said to have planted the church there in Hierapolis and also in Colossae. And that was likely during Paul's three-year ministry in Ephesus. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 19 and Acts chapter 20. Okay, so today what we will see, what we will read about is this strong rebuke and also some encouraging words from the Lord to this church here in Laodicea. And like I said, this is important now, just as important now as it was then because of this current cha uh, church age that we are living in. So as we've done before, let me read the whole letter to you. It's, it's, it's short. It's only a few verses. And then we can look at it verse by verse. So the letter to Laodicea, uh, Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, says, 
Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing, but you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy for me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, anointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him um, and, and he with me. Verse 21, to the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. So the first thing we see here with this letter to uh, Laodicea, we see here in the very first part of verse 14, the, the letter is specifically addressed to this church, right? It says, write to the angel of the church of Laodicea. So this was the introduction that we've seen with all the other churches as well. Um, the Lord here, through John, is writing to this specific church. Now the angel, once again, could be a representative or perhaps the pastor of that particular church. Now, in the second part of verse 14, the Lord then goes ahead and introduces who he is. It says there, thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. So the Lord begins here with this fundamental truth about himself, right? It's a reminder of his character and the fact that he's filled with faithfulness and with truth. He is the one who guarantees and fulfills the promises of God, right? He is the amen, which can be translated, so be it. He is the, it is done. If you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, it says, for every one of God's promises is yes in him. Therefore, through him, we also say amen to the glory of God. Now notice that he also identifies himself as the originator, okay? Now, he's not saying, he's not saying that he was the first being to be created. That's not what the Lord is saying there. But rather, the Lord is identifying himself as the person of the Holy Trinity who was the agent of all creation, okay? And Jesus has this preeminent position, and I'll, I'll read a, a section here from Colossians to, to show you this, um, he has this preeminent position of being the firstborn. Though this does not mean that Jesus was literally the firstborn, right? Because Jesus was not created. And in fact, he didn't have a beginning, right? But is the beginning. Um, the, ori the origin, rather, of, creation, of the creation of God. If you look in John verse 3 of chapter 1, it says, All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. If you look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18, it says, He, the Lord, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He's also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. So once again, the Lord here in his preeminent um, entity, right, over all creation, he's holding it all together as well. And when you think about it, you think about the universe we live in right now, right? Like, the rotation of the planets, the fact that we're rotating, you know, in this direction, we're going around the sun in this elliptical pattern, the stars, the movement, all of that is Christ-centric. Like he's holding all of that in his hands, all of creation, which is amazing. 
And in fact, just last week, you know, we had that annular solar eclipse, and, and I was super excited about that. You know, Angel made fun of me, but it was, it was, I was really excited, right? And just the alignment of the moon and the sun and the, the incoming solar radiation, like the physics, all of that is so complicated. But the fact that God, like, was holding all of that in his hands is just amazing. And it gives us this indication of his control and the fact that he's in control of everything. And I think that's a beautiful reminder to us this morning because of everything that's going on in the world and perhaps what's going on in your own life. Do remember that the Lord has everything in his hands. Everything is Christ-centric. And here he reminds us of this through his word. Now, in the next little section here, and this is uh, the next two verses, what we're going to see is what he knows about this particular church in Laodicea. So beginning in verse 15, he tells them, he says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Pretty heavy. So like with all the other churches, the Lord knew everything about them, just like he does about this church, right? He knew their works. And in the case of the church of Laodicea, unfortunately, they were not in the place spiritually where they needed to be or where the Lord perhaps desired them to be. And I think what we need to understand is that in this Christian race, there are three temperatures that we can have spiritually. We can be hot, right, on fire for the Lord. And that's an example of perhaps a believer that is doing the Lord's will and is on fire for him, doing the things he or she has been called to do. We can have a cold heart towards the Lord or be cold. And think of the time before you came to the Lord when you were not a believer and your heart was cold towards the Lord. And then, of course, the last one is a lukewarm heart or being lukewarm towards the Lord. And believe it or not, the worst spiritual temperature is not having a cold heart towards the Lord. It's being lukewarm in the middle because that's a very dangerous place to be because of complacency and laziness and just going through the motions. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But in the case of Laodicea, they were lukewarm. And what's interesting, and I mentioned this at the beginning, remember that Colossae was, was famous for their pure and cold water, and Hierapolis was famous for their hot springs. That water, when it was pumped into Laodicea, when it got there, it was already lukewarm. And it was very reminiscent of that church. I found that very interesting. But once again, believe it or not, the worst spiritual temperature is to be lukewarm. And when you think about a lukewarm Christian or a lukewarm believer, they can be characterized as being comfortable, being complacent. They don't realize their needs because they're blinded. Lukewarmness is our natural tendency because of our fallen nature. Because we have a fallen nature, we want to be lukewarm. That's what happens. We, we just regulate. We go to that temperature spiritually. We have enough of Jesus to satisfy a craving for spirituality or for religion or for whatever, but not enough for eternal life. We have to be careful with that, right? We have to remember that the church is not to set their stakes too deep in this planet. And it's the things of this world that make us lukewarm, right? Philippians 3.20 tells us that our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait for the Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in his sermon, an earnest warning against lukewarmness, Spurgeon once described a lukewarm church in the following way. He says, they have prayer meetings but there are few present, for they like quiet evenings at home. When more attend the meetings, they are still very dull, for they do their praying very deliberately and are afraid of being so excited. They are content to have all things done decently and in order, but vigor and zeal are considered to be vulgar. They may have schools, Bible classes, preaching rooms, and all sorts of agencies, but they might as well be without them, for no energy is displayed and no good comes from them. They have deacons and elders who are excellent pillars of the church. If the chief quality of the pillars be to stand still and exhibit no motion or emotion, the pastor does not fly very far in preaching and the everlasting gospel, and he certainly has no flame of fire in the preaching. The pastor may be, shining, may be a shining light of eloquence, but he certainly is not a burning light of grace, setting men's hearts on fire. Everything is done in a half-hearted, listless, dead, and alive way, as if it did not matter much whether it was done or not. 
Things are respect respectably done. The rich families are not offended. The skeptical party is conciliated. And the good people are not quite alienated. Things are made pleasant all around. The right things are done. But as to doing them with all your might and soul and strength, a Laodicean church has no notion of what that means. They are not so cold as to abandon their work or to give up their meetings of prayer or to reject the gospel. They are neither hot for the truth, nor hot for conversions, nor hot for holiness. They are not fiery enough to burn the stubble of sin, nor zealous enough to make Satan angry, nor fervent enough to make a living sacrifice of themselves upon the altar of their God. They are neither cold nor hot. And I can tell you, when I read this, it was, it was very heavy to read this and very convicting to read this. And um, it made me really reanalyze my own heart, but also the heart of the church itself. And I want you to think about lukewarm water, for example. You guys have must, must have drank some luke wa lukewarm water before. I don't know about you guys, but when I drink lukewarm water, I spit it out right away. Like, I can't stand lukewarm water. I can take a cold drink or a warm beverage, but, but not lukewarm water. In fact, you can induce vomiting by drinking lukewarm water or by gargling with lukewarm water. And in fact, the Lord tells the church of Laodicea in verse 16, he says, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. And what a sad thing to be so despicable to God that he doesn't want to use you as his voice or his mouthpiece anymore, but rather he wants to spit you out of his mouth and vomit you out because you're lukewarm. And I think that's a very convicting thing you know, for anybody. And I think the problem that, we, that happens to us, and I think to the church too, is when we become isolated from the Lord, that's when we become um, lukewarm. And you know, many of you know that I teach chemistry and I teach physics at, a, at an early college high school. And we always go through a unit of, of thermodynamics, and the kids hate thermodynamics because it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of math and stuff. But when you think about thermodynamics, the laws tell us that when you have a closed system, if you're not adding energy to it, you're not taking energy out of it, like eventually it's going to regulate and die off. And as the church, we never ever want to be a closed system, right? We cannot do anything as, you know, apart or set aside from the Lord. And in fact, John 15, 5 tells us, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. And we know that aside from the Lord, we can't do anything. Like, we could try. It might last for a little bit, but you're going to get tired. You're going to get worn out, and eventually you're going to decay and die. We've got to be very careful with that. The church of Laodicea, they were too confident in themselves. They became independent and self-satisfied. They were secure in their own mind, but they were becoming a closed system. And we'll talk more about that in verse 17. But God is so good because God pursues us. In fact, if you look in verse 20, there John documents for us. It says, See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. So the Lord was outside the Laodicean church system. He was knocking on the door. He just wanted to come in to reignite what had been lost. And we'll talk more about verse 20 in just a little bit. You see, the Lord prefers that we be hot or zealous for him. And he also prefer we be cold. That is, our hearts will be cold and driven to the warmth of God as opposed to being lukewarm and complacent. Because when you think about it, think of like, for example, um, on the, thief, the thief that was on the cross, right? He clearly was cold towards Jesus, but he recognized or realized his need. John, remember John the Beloved, right? He was hot towards Jesus and enjoyed a relationship of love with the Lord. But Judas was lukewarm. He followed the Lord enough to be considered a disciple. However, his heart wasn't entirely given to the Lord, making him lukewarm. And when we're lukewarm, it's like having a foot in the world and having a foot in the church. And that's a very unpleasant and miserable place to be. And I think we talked a little bit about that before with some of these other churches here in Asia Minor. Having too much of the world to be happy with Jesus. And I think one of the questions we need to ask ourselves, maybe continuously, is, you know, am I a, am I a Laodicean Christian? Is this a Laodicean church in terms of our spiritual temperature? 
And church, if you're, if you're lukewarm this morning, you have to ask yourself why. And you have to figure out how to get out of that, right? Why am I lukewarm this morning? And maybe there's some circumstances in your life that have made you lukewarm, but you have to figure out how to change those things. And when we are lukewarm, we are just simply going through the motions, for example. And I think a lot of us have been in that position or in that place before. And we saw this, for example, with the church of Ephesus. I don't have the map up there, but the church of Ephesus, right, that first church um, that, we, that we talked about, they were just going through the motions. They were doing some great things for the Lord, but they were, doing it, they were doing these things simply going through the motions. They were busy for the Lord, but they weren't busy with the Lord. And it was all because they had left their first love. And I can tell you there have been seasons in my life where the Lord, not the Lord, but the enemy has put it into my mind where the circumstances of my life have become so overwhelming where he says, hey, why don't you take a break from God for a minute and focus on your circumstances, focus on your difficulties. And I can tell you from personal experience that it'll make you a lukewarm Christian really, really quick. And we have to be very careful. The enemy doesn't want you to be hot for the Lord, but believe it or not, he doesn't care if you're cold for the Lord either because he's already won you over if you're cold for the Lord, right? That's when you're a non-believer. But rather, he prizes a lukewarm Christian heart. That's what he prizes, even over a cold-hearted sinner. And maybe this morning, your heart is somewhere else. Maybe you're, you're focusing right now on, I don't know, an addiction. Maybe you're focusing on your addiction. Maybe you're focusing on your failing marriage. Maybe you're focusing on relationship that is deteriorating. Maybe you have bad health. Whatever it is that you're focusing on, there's so much going on in the world right now. That'll quickly turn you into a closed system and make you lukewarm. And we have to be very careful and put the focus back on the Lord. And we have to remember that what we are going through is not unique to us, right? The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, no temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. So this morning, whatever you're focusing on, whatever your heart is on this morning that is making you lukewarm, we have to turn from those things and open the door of our hearts to the Lord as he knocks. And that's exactly what the church of Laodicea needed to do. They needed to put their eyes back on, on the Lord. That's the place of safety. That's the place of peace. That's a place of satisfaction. And in fact, if you look in verse 17, and we talked a little bit about this already, the Lord's going to show us or share with us what exactly he had against them. He says in verse 17 uh, through John, he says, For you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, I need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Now, if you remember back to the second chapter of Revelation, we talked about this a while back, um, you think about the church of Smyrna. Remember, Smyrna thought themselves to be poor, but they really weren't poor, right? They were rich spiritually. You see, Smyrna was facing some great persecution in their church. But in the midst of the persecution, they remained faithful to the Lord. So in a sense, to the world, they looked poor, but in the Lord, spiritually, they were very rich. On the other hand, the church of Laodicea bragged about being rich, but were in fact poor. They were poor spiritually. The Lord even describes them here. He says that they are wretched, they are pitiful, they are poor, blind, and that they are naked. And if you remember, this city, I don't know if I mentioned this at the beginning, they were famous for an eye salve, okay? This is like, almost like medicated eye drops, if you want to think about that today. Um, but they were spiritually blind, right? They were famous for some of the clothing that was made there, but they were spiritually naked and in shame. And unfortunately for this lukewarm church, they were blind and they were naked and shamed um, that they were, they were too blind to even see spiritually what they needed. And I heard it once said that the Lord's purpose has been hurt more by Sunday morning bench warmers who pretend to love Christ, who call him Lord, but do not follow his commands than all those that are not in Christ combined. And I think that's a pretty heavy statement there. So, if you're here this morning and you're a bench warmer, you want to get up and get in the game. And, you know, when I was in high school, I was in marching band. They used to call us the bleacher creatures, okay? And in the Lord, in the church, we don't want to be bleacher creatures, right? We want to be in the game 
pointing people to Jesus, warming hearts, and, um, and building God's kingdom. And that's exactly what the Lord desired from the church of Laodicea. And in fact, in verse 18, 19, and 20, we'll break this up into a couple of sections, he tells them exactly what he needed of them or what he wanted them to do. If you look in verse 18, he, he tells them, he says, I advise you to buy for me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed, and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, and ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. And we know in order for change to take place in our lives, we have to recognize first that we need help, right? And this church needed to recognize their spiritual condition, and the fact that they needed help spiritually to be right with the Lord. And I know for me, when the Lord refines me and, and corrects me, which is very often, um, sometimes it can be very painful at times because it requires change. And change is bad, right? When you're comfortable and complacent and you're in a closed system, change is bad. You don't want to change. You want to be comfortable. But believe it or not, by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit, he will give you the will and the desire and the stamina to make that change. In fact, if you look in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. So even though the change is painful, the Lord, through the power and the person of his Holy Spirit, will allow you to do that. Okay. So the solution here, he tells them, was to pay the price and to get true gold refined in the fire. And what does this mean practically? Well, this meant that the church of Laodicea needed to be uncomfortable in order for the Lord to do his work in them and, and through them. Okay? And we know that nothing makes Christians examine their hearts more than being uncomfortable, right? Um, or being in a state of suffering. In fact, if you look in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, it says there, you rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's in those darkest hours, right? It's in those challenging times that the Lord can break us and humble us, and then he can use us, right? Because he changes us first. In fact, James 4.10 tells us, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. And that's exactly what the church of Laodicea needed to do. They needed to humble themselves before the Lord, allow the Lord to break them and to mend them. That way they could be exalted in due time in accordance to the Lord's timing. Notice the Lord also tells them that they needed white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed. So if you think back to the beginning of the Bible, for example, in the book of Genesis, if you look there in the third chapter, if you remember, I know for the men's group, it's been years since we've been there. But um, remember, Adam and Eve were made aware of their nakedness and their shame, you know, after they had violated um, what the Lord had commanded them to do. They had sinned against their creator. Remember what it said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. It said, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So they covered that nakedness and they covered that shame. And in a sense, this is what the Lord was telling the church here in Laodicea. But what he's referring to here is practical righteousness in everyday living. And everyone in here has a winter coat, right? Everyone has like a heavy coat that they wear. I think we wear it like twice a year in El Paso, but everyone has a winter coat. And... Um, when you put on that winter coat, like, what does that do for you? Well, obviously, it insulates the heat in your body, right? We, we radiate long wave energy, and it, it heats the jacket. The heat comes back in. It keeps us warm. It keeps us away from all the outside elements, right, like the cold weather and the wind. Um, and in a sense, this is what the Lord wants them to do. He wants them to clothe themselves in him, in the Lord, to hide that shame, to hide um, that sin. In other words, to keep it from being exposed, to keep it from becoming active, to keep it dormant. So they have to clothe themselves with him and to keep the world out as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about keeping the world out in verse 20. But we know that practical righteousness and practical living can only come by having a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
and allowing the Holy Spirit to dwell in your heart and in your life and to change you and to refine you because that's only the work that the Holy Spirit can do. And once again, this church in Laodicea, clothing themselves in the Lord will allow them to no longer expose this shame and this nakedness, this so-called shame and nakedness, which was this, this shameful way of living um, in which wasn't very pleasing to the Lord. But then notice he tells them, an ointment, he tells them to get ointment to spread on their eyes so that they may see. Now, this church, once again, was blinded to their spiritual condition, their spiritual state. They were literally in a spiritual drought. Remember what 2 Peter 1, 5 through 9 tells us. It says there, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing, the cleansing rather, from his past sins. So this was kind of the state that um, the church of Laodicea was in, and they needed to do these do these things rather, um, to get to that place where they needed to be. Because if we're not growing in the Lord, we're backsliding in the Lord, right? Oh, no, I'm neutral. No, you're backsliding, right? You're either growing or you're backsliding. You're not neutral. There's no middle, there's no middle ground there. And they needed to apply some heavenly eye self is what they needed to do. Remember, the city was famous for their eye, for their eye self. And once again, you think about that in modern days, it'd be like medicated eye drops, Okay. And this was only available from the great physician himself, the Lord. And this kind of reminded me of the Lord's earthly ministry. Remember when he healed that blind man? If you look in Mark chapter 8, for example, beginning in verse 23, it says, He took the blind man by the hand and brought him out of the village, spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him. He asked him, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking. And then in Mark chapter 8, verse 25, it's, it says, Again, Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes. The man looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. So just like this man in Christ, with his heavenly self, we can see everything clearly, kind of like with a fresh vision. In fact, this particular verse, verse 25, is the verse behind the name of this church, Fresh Vision, Calvary Chapel, and Pastor Angel can tell you more about that. But only heavenly eye self could cure the spiritual blindness that this church had. They needed to recognize where they were spiritually. Now in verse 19, he continues and he tells them, As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Remember what the Proverbs tell us. If you look at Proverbs 3, 11 through 12, it says, Do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe in discipline. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as the father disciplines the son in whom he delights. And God is so good. So even though this church was in a really bad place, they were lukewarm, he still loved them enough to chasten them. And the Lord sometimes will allow the church to go through seasons of difficulty, even some awful seasons, for the purposes of chastening and changing us. And once again, it's in those difficult, breaking, humbling times that the Lord can do the greatest work. But then he tells them to be zealous and to repent. They needed to repent of their pride, and they needed to humble themselves and not rely so much on themselves. They needed to cultivate a burning heart for the Lord, right? To be in that place again where they were, for the Lord had stopped being the center of their life. And um, they, were, they were lukewarm Christians, or, or as the young people put it, they were mid, right? They weren't, you know, <laughs> they were mediocre, okay? I don't know, the kids say mid all the time. Ah, he's mid. Ah, she's mid. That's mid, sir. All right, so um, they were mid Christians is what was happening here, right? They needed to be on fire for the Lord. And sometimes we too as believers in the church, like I think often, right, we have to rekindle that fire. We go through these seasons where we start to get lukewarm and we have to add more, you know, more heat to the fire. And the Lord does that in various ways. And we have to accept it and receive it. But often the Lord, you know, we just have to open the, the door of our heart for him to do that. And the beauty of this, once again, is the Lord is always pursuing us. He's so good. 
If you look in verse 20, here he's speaking to the church, but also he's speaking to us, like I said, in this current church age. He says, See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. And I love this verse because it reminds me and reminds us of God's patience, God's long-suffering with us. God knocks through circumstances and he calls through his word. And I want you to think back when you were a teenager. Um, I don't know how far back was that for some of us in this room. Um, was emo a thing then? I don't know. Maybe you were acting emo when you were a teenager and you barricaded yourself in your room and your parents were trying to get in there. Your parents knocked the door down, didn't they? And they took it off the hinges. Guys, the Lord's not going to you know, knock his way into your heart. I mean, he's not going to pl- you know, plunge into your heart like that. He's going to knock and you have to open the door. You see, every person in this room, every person on this planet is the Lord of their own heart. Only we can open that door. He can't just barge in there like our parents used to, right? When we used to barricade ourselves in our rooms. Only the Lord can, can knock and come in if we let him in. And the reason he does that is because he wants us to choose. He wants us to have that option. And here, this church, the Lord was outside. He was knocking on the door. He just wanted to have fellowship with them. He wanted to have communion with them. He wanted the church to have that desire to abide in him like before. And we know that fruit only comes from abiding. And it's only when we invite him into our lives, into our hearts, that we can truly walk in the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. We have the victory. We just have to choose to walk in it. And it requires opening that door um, to the Lord. And the beauty of this is that anyone can let the door in. Uh, Anyone can open the door, rather, to their heart and let the Lord in. And maybe this morning you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you want to open that door to your heart. You know, we'll give you an opportunity to do that in just a little bit here. But once again, what a beautiful illustration, I believe, of our Lord, his patience and his love and the fact that he pursues us because he loves us so much. Now, something that is very important to remember and to understand is that at the same time the Lord is knocking on the door of our heart, the world is also knocking on the door of our heart. Sin, strongholds, things in our past that used to take a hold of us, those things are always knocking. I know for me, those things are always knocking on the door. And sometimes we're so foolish, we just open the door of our heart and let those things back into our lives. And I don't know if this is like a a Mexican thing or like a Latino thing, but like when somebody knocks on a Mexican or Latino's door, like nobody wants to open the door, right? Like people hide, they turn off the lights. And, like, the blinds are moving up and down, you know? Like, they're very cautious. I don't know, like, what we're, I think we're afraid people want to steal from us. I don't know. But just like that, right, when things are knocking on the heart of our, the, 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 the door of our heart, rather, we want to be very careful. We want to just open the door and let whatever is out there in because the world is, can fool us very quickly, right? And we have to be very careful. The, the, the enemy knows our tendencies. The enemy knows our desires and He wants to knock and get his way into our heart. And in fact, Galatians 5, verses 16 through 17 tells us, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't don't do what you want. So we got to keep the world out of our hearts, right? We got to be careful. We, we need to understand, we need to recognize the Lord's knock. And the only way we can do that is to be in his word and to be in communion with him and to be, just be with him, be in him, right? And him in us as well. We'll know what his knock is like. It's like that secret knock, right, to the tree house, right? We know it's the Lord and wanting to get in. Um, but sometimes we can be blinded to that, just like this church in Laodicea. If you look in verse 21, there it gives a promise of a reward. And I think this is really, really beautiful. It says, to the one who conquers... I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And once again, this is a beautiful promise to the believer. Here we are reminded of the fact that as believers, as overcomers, that we will share the glory of Christ, the Christ's throne rather. We will share the glory of Christ's throne and reign with him. And what is specifically being spoken of here is actually that millennial reign, okay? That time after the great tribulation period, but right before the great white throne judgment, when Satan is bounded and when the Lord establishes his kingdom 
on the earth for a thousand years. That is that period of time that is being spoken of here in Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. You can look there if you want to reference that a little bit later. So what he's really talking about is his actual second coming, when he physically comes to this planet again for a second time. Of course, we know that first time was when he was born in Bethlehem in a manger um, to the Virgin Mary, right? And eventually went to the cross. And then notice he says, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So there he's speaking. He's looking ahead to that heavenly throne room, which actually you can read about in the next two chapters there in Revelation. John documents that for us. But remember that just as Jesus has overcome um, and he has suffered, you know, we, when we do that with him, together with him, we too will also share in his glory and in his um in his rewards we'll be with him i think that's just the main thing we need to understand here which is a beautiful thing um a lukewarm christian in laodicea for example if you if you're like a lukewarm christian of laodicea you need to understand what your spiritual condition is and the only way to overcome that is to remove that veil from your eyes to be unblinded if you will and that's where the word of god comes in that's where brothers and sisters in christ come in that's where accountability comes in, and that's where the tugging of the Holy Spirit comes in. But this is exactly what this particular church needed. And like I said, this was one of the harshest letters that we've read so far to these seven churches. But yet at the very end, there's this beautiful, remarkable promise that's made to them. And I believe that this shows us that even the worst of humanity can repent and conquer and attain the highest state of glory. And I know right now there's a lot going on in our world. And you think about the terrorists, for example, you know, in the flesh, we want to call them the enemy and we wish terrible things upon them. But we have to understand that the Lord has died for everybody. And just like we have come to salvation, they also can have the opportunity because the Lord has died for them too. And that's why we have to continue to pray for them as well um, and not leave them out of our prayers because of, of how we feel emotionally. Because let me tell you, there's people that prayed for us. They didn't leave us out of our prayers, even though they thought we didn't deserve to know the Lord. And we're so grateful for those people in our lives today. And then notice finally, he ends with this in verse 22. He says, let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So once again, we need to listen to what the Holy Spirit's saying to us here as he speaks to this church, because we're still in this church age. So he's speaking to us too. It's important that we listen and we take this to heart and we put it into practice. And if we do listen, he will be faithful to deliver us from becoming and being a lukewarm, self-reliant, complacent Christian like this church of Laodicea. So in closing this morning, um, you think about this letter as a whole, it's almost like an MRI or an X-ray of our hearts individually, but I think also as the church as a whole. And this letter, as we read it, it was filled with a lot of rebuke. It was filled with a lot of maybe what you would consider harshness. But really, there was a lot of encouragement in here as well because the Lord loved this church just as he loves the church today. And he wants the church to be in the right place. And as believers and as a church, we have to continuously evaluate ourselves and the ministries because the Lord is going to judge everything and everyone. And we know from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, that that judgment is going to begin in the house of the Lord. And I think, unfortunately, right now, we're living in a time where the church is becoming lukewarm, right? We're living in a time that is very reminiscent of the church of Laodicea. Materialism and wealth and, um, you know, exalting yourself above everyone else is being brought above a lost world, right? Like, people want those things over ministering to a lost world. There's a lot of Christians that are wearing crowns, but they're not bearing crosses. And we don't want to be like that, right? We want to bear crosses and, and do the things the Lord has called us to do. There's so many people right now in the church that are so loud for a politician. They're so loud for a movement. They're so loud for this and for that, for their rights, for this and this. But the truth of the matter is we need to be loud for the gospel. We're on team Jesus right now. And like, that's the best place to be. If he is for us, who could be against us, right? And as we pour into temporary things, right, that's going to affect our spiritual temperature. And we need to be careful because when we pour into the temporary, whatever's left over, that's what we're going to give to God. And it's not going to be very much. And we're just, be, we're just going to be going through those motions. We've got to be very careful of that. 
our lifestyles and our behaviors, not necessarily yours, I'm saying, but the lifestyles and the behaviors of the church right now are very reminiscent of those last days that Timothy speaks of in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. So there he says, But know this, hard times will come in the last days, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanders, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid these people. In church this morning, as we leave this place, as we go about our week, we need to ask ourselves, are we a Christian? Are we, are we living as a Christian would on the eve of Christ's return? Are we living with the mind and the heart set that the Lord could return imminently, right? Like he could return right now. He could return tomorrow at any moment. Are we living in that way? Are we a Laodicean Christian? Are we a Laodicean church? You know, a lukewarm Christian has enough of Jesus to be satisfied, but still has a lot of the world in them. And that's something we need to be very careful of. And if you're a lukewarm Christian this morning, I encourage you to set that fire again in your heart. First, you need to recognize that your spiritual, what your spiritual need is. Like, hey, I need help spiritually, right? I'm in a really bad place right now. Secondly, you need to open the door of your heart and let the Lord back in. Surrender your heart to the Lord so he can do a work in you. That way he can do a work through you. Get to know his word again. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and pray um, without ceasing. Now, Pastor Chuck once said, God's word is the only reliable guideline for living. Following your heart without the leading of his word and his spirit will lead you to his judgment. And we saw this with the church of Laodicea this morning. And then in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, the Lord tells us there, You're all the, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. We don't want to lose our spiritual saltiness due to mediocreness, right? We want to be on fire. We want to be hot for the Lord, not lukewarm for the Lord this morning. So this morning, as we, as we go about our days, we go about this week, evaluate your hearts and, and truly ask yourself, what is, my, what is my spiritual temperature? You know, where am I at right now in the Lord? And that way we can continue working in the Lord and be on fire and be hot for the Lord and not lukewarm for the Lord. Amen. So this morning, if you are maybe watching the live stream and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and um, you want to give your life to the Lord, Maybe you're tired of, of um, wrestling and just battling the battles of this world on your own. Or maybe you're, you're watching and you're, you're lukewarm right now. You want to rededicate your life to the Lord. We want to give you that opportunity this morning. You know, the Lord is always knocking on our hearts, the door of our hearts, and we just simply have to open that door to him. And this morning, if that's you, if you could just close your eyes, bow your head, and just repeat this prayer after me. Of course, you need to, you need to mean this with all your heart. The Lord doesn't want your lip service. He wants your heart. He wants all of you. You know, he's a jealous God. So this morning, if that's you, you can just say this prayer with me. Lord, this morning, I want to declare you as my Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried. And I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I recognize that I am a sinner, and I pray that you forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Change me and use me for your glory. I ask these things, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you prayed that this morning, we want to welcome you once again to the family of Christ. And the Gospel of Luke tells us that even when one sinner repents, that the angels celebrate in heaven. So they're celebrating on your behalf. And if you need any more information about our church, or maybe you want to learn about getting connected to another Bible teaching church, we can get you that information. You can call the church. You can send us an email or uh, you can leave a message there in the, um, in the comment section on the video if you need a Bible, anything like that. So we will be praying for you. We hope you can join us again uh, next week. And um, we love you and we'll see you again soon. So bye for now.